Hey, welcome back to The Urban Monk. It has been a while. I've been on a journey making docu-series uh, and then skiing for a bit. And so now I'm back, a little work-life balance. Um, and um, I have been really excited about getting the podcast going again. It's taken a minute to get going. Uh, there's some changes happening in the Shojai household. So that we're going to be moving and doing some things that um, are going to be kind of interesting and abrupt that I'll tell you about later. Um, but the podcast is back, uh, back and black here and we're going to start uh, doing it more often. And um, I only want to talk about conversations that are new, novel, haven't really been had before. And I got a good friend, a uh, personal physician of mine uh, in the past, dear friend, guy I go rock climbing with, um, just all around great person slash doctor who's doing some really uh, amazing work on the secret life of the liver, if you will, <laughs> and how much it actually has to do with uh, more than we thought. And so I would love to welcome back Dr. Alan Christensen. Welcome, my friend. Hey, Pedro. Super jazzed to be here with you. This is, this is cool. Man, I miss you. If this is how we got to hang out, then this is, <laughs> this is where <laughs> we're going to catch up. Take what yeah. I can get, I guess. <laughs> that's it. That's it. That's it. I mean, so Alan, Alan's the guy that, you know, I'll be in some conference, uh, you know, within 100 miles of his house. He'll come pick me up and abduct me from the conference. <laughs> And take me rock climbing and rappelling into sinkholes in, in the Sedona <laughs> Desert because that's more fun. <laughs> and he's writing about it every time. It's just it's just wonderful. So, um, you know, you're, you're running a big practice out there. I know that you've kind of taken time off to write a few books uh, and and kind of, you know, kind of come in and out of clinical care. But I know you've always had your finger on it because you just love being a doctor. And the new work that you're doing is just it's fascinating to me. So I would love for you to just kind of share where, where you've been and what you're up to now. You know, exciting thing is the perennial concern that the audience has had has been struggles with, with weight. And then number two has been the struggles with energy. And I've always trying to figure out how to better, you know, what are those things? What's the common thread? And what's the thing that, what's the thing people are missing? You know, what are the, what are the assumptions or the attempts that are in the right direction, but not quite completely landing? That's what I've been trying to sort out. Yeah. And, and every single tabloid is talking about it in some different angle all the time. Everyone's, you know, one, you know, cleanse away or one keto fad diet away from, you know, having the answer. And, you know, I could, I could attest to this is, you know, you do all these kind of like Atkins 2.0 type of diets and while you're on it, it's fine. And then as mm -hmm. soon as you stop, um, you're right back to where you started. The weight comes right back. It's incredibly frustrating. Um, and you hear this time and again, and this isn't new. This isn't just like, oh yeah, you know, keto, keto is the new thing. Keto is the new Atkins. And this has been going on for a long time. Uh, and so what I like about the conversation we're about to have is, you know, once you start understanding kind of the anatomy and the physiology and kind of the role and the function of the liver, things get a lot more clear. Yeah. You know, and that's the thing is that right now as we're talking, I, I can't see you, but I'm assuming you're not eating and I'm, I'm not eating at this moment, you know, so our bodies, we're using a fair amount of energy to power our brains and keep our bodies warm, but we're not obtaining energy. And that same thing is true about just countless numbers of accessory micronutrients and hormones. And this is all stuff that our liver is sorting out. You know, it's like when we left the ocean, we created this internal, uh, aquarium filter and it's not just a filter it's still storehouse and that's our liver so when it works right we effortlessly have steady energy and you know our bodies are not trying to carry trapped fat around the midsection that doesn't serve them in any health way so when the body works right we keep those things in proper balance and when it's off we've come to expect that it's the normal that it's just like what happens but no it means something is wrong and the common thread for many people is that the liver is having an easier time storing fuel than it is at burning fuel. So let's talk about that. So liver's function is to store fuel. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, from there, then when we need the fuel, it has to release it for access. And when it stores more than it burns, we have it around our midsection. Uh, so can we talk about that, like glycogen reserves and just, just kind of back, back into uh, how this works so that we could uh, pick it apart? Yeah, so there's three types of fat storage. And the word fat is used in a lot of different contexts. That makes things misleading. But we've got fat under the skin, which we call subcutaneous fat. You know, curious thing, we're the only mammals that live on the land that have subcutaneous fat. <laughs> yes. uh, then we have the visceral fat or the belly fat. But the most insidious of all is the organ fat, the stuff that builds up 
inside the organ cells, mostly liver, pancreas, and muscle tissue, or between those cells. So what the liver does for storing fuel, there's two main forms. There's glycogen and triglyceride. And glycogen is only from carbohydrate, specifically glucose. And triglyceride can be made out of anything. You know, if you're past the point of having glycogen filled up, you can make carbs into triglyceride. Fats go straight into triglyceride. Ketones even make triglyceride. So it is alcohol. So it's easy to make. And glycogen is a lot less concentrated. It takes up a lot of room. And triglycerides can be packed more tightly. So what happens is if there's a fuel overload, we've got so much of it spills over into triglyceride, we've, we've physically crowded out the room for glycogen. And the pitfall, you can think about the two of those like, a, like kindling and a log, you know, for a campfire. So glycogen is like the kindling and triglyceride is like the log, but like a long, steady burn. And you can't get the log ignited without the kindling. So when triglyceride is crowded out glycogen, you can't ignite triglyceride and thus begets the whole cycle of toxic fat buildup and suppressed metabolism. Great, great analogy. So what is happening? Why are we starting to correct? Why, why, why do we have more logs and kindling and how do we <laughs> shift that balance? Well, a couple of things can happen. So one of which is just dietary patterns. If we've got proportionately not enough stuff to make kindling, if there's no, no quality carbohydrate, that can be an issue. Another thing is just how much total fuel. And this is thing, something I really put a lot of passion into. So I talked before about how we've been circling around these problems. You know, there's a lot of ways someone can change their diet and have short-term health improvements if they lower their fuel intake. You know, maybe they've gone vegan and they end up cutting out a lot of processed food, or maybe they went paleo and cut out a lot of refined grains, or they've gone, yeah, like more traditional Atkins and just cut down total carbohydrate. So the extent to which you're looking at fuel, I talk about is like fats and carbs, ketones, they're all just fuel. And when you break down the biochemistry of the liver burning fuel, all those things are is oxaloacetate. They're made out of the exact same thing and it's all, oxal it's all oxaloacetate. So when there's a fuel overload, now that can be plain old too much fuel, that can be the body not requiring a normal amount of fuel, or that can be the body not burning fuel properly. And any of those can do this. And fuel is different from calories because protein, fibers, resistant starch, they can comprise calories, but they don't work the same way in the liver. How does it work? So um, liver is designed to store uh, fuel as glycogen and then triglycerides. And then protein, your, the protein and fiber, you're saying, has kind of different math. Can we get into that? For sure. So fiber itself is non-caloric, so there's that. Resistant starch is half the caloric load of carbohydrate, and it has a glycogen sparing effect and a blood sugar regulating effect. So it doesn't work the same as any other fuel source in that regard. And then protein's a different animal in a lot of ways. So protein intake independently correlates with just basal metabolism, with body composition. And then we look at the, the, the food offset, like how much something fills you up. So protein tends to have the greatest satiety factor gram per gram. So it's something that we're less apt to have too much of. So yeah, that's a case in which calories are, are not, not the best metric, but, but fuel is very predictable. Hmm. And you said the quality carbs and total fuel are part of the, that equation. So mm -hmm. uh, total fuel we just talked about, what are quality carbs in, in your assessment? Yeah, so it's healthy to have some things that we can make easily into glucose. So glucose, you know, our, our blood sugar is dependent upon that. that. That's what we have to burn for our brain's function. And in roundabout ways, we can burn other substrates for periods of time. But when we do so, then we're just taking glucose from our muscle tissue. So if you're into ketosis, for example, your body still has to have glucose, but rather than have any glucose in the diet, you're making muscle tissue into glucose to get that same effect. And there's, there's a difference between how fructose plays out and how glucose plays out. And that's, that's a critical thing for just being able to burn the triglycerides to have some glucose to store away as glycogen. So fructose being found in fruits traditionally, but then also kind of um, manipulated it to be put into kind of high fructose corn syrup and all that. So how does that affect the liver? You know, it's a funny thing. There's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of ideas that fructose is inherently harmful for liver function. And I, I used to think that based on the chemistry, but I looked more deeply into that. And it turns out that any, once, you're, once you're at your, your body's fuel needs, once you've already like filled the tank, so to speak, pretty much anything that spills out over the top is going to be dangerous. 
And that's true of fructose. But the harms, even the harms of fructose are not as apparent when you're below the basal fuel needs. So it's really only at excess. But mm -hmm. at that same point, any kind of fuel source becomes harmful when it's at excess. And there's not even data saying one is that much worse than another. They, they all look mm. very similar. Yeah, sure. I mean, you choke an engine, you choke an engine, right? And yeah, whether it's so, diesel or unleaded, or <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter, right? It's just it. it there's not there's too much too much fuel, not enough spark, not enough fire, or yeah. frankly, you're just not driving fast enough. So yeah. traditionally, you think of the liver as a detox organ, and so mm -hmm. what you're bringing forth is this is actually kind of the primary metabolic organ that like is in charge of energy, uh, you know, the throttling or this, you know, synthesis or release of energy. So let's talk about what that, you know, wh where those things cross over. Cause a lot of people are saying, you know, well, the, we live in such a toxic world. It's these yeah. obesogens. It's all these, um, you know, just all these additives that are in our food or in our environment that are causing the liver to be overloaded. Does that have anything to do with this equation? You know, it, it does. And those are all relevant factors and the liver is being active with detox. Funny thing is that the thing that takes the most work for detox by far is energy production. <laughs> you know, we, we yeah. make way more free radicals and inflammatory compounds from generating energy than we ever do from processing waste apart from like, you know, the classic industrial accidents. So yeah, so detox is important, but the cumulative load of strain on the liver predicts how well any of those subcategories tend to work. So if it's on fuel overload and there's some BPA we're exposed to in the environment, that changes it. And the other thing it's doing too, is it's regulating our body's hormone balance. We often don't realize this, but all of our glands that release hormones, they, they make them pretty haphazardly. They, there's different forms of the hormones. Like the adrenals just squirt out a ton of cortisone and a little bit of cortisol. And the expectation is that your liver is going to take that and fine tune it and make it as you need it in the moment. Uh, but if you're exposed to lead, if you've got some lead in your water, which a third of the households in America do, that can make your liver not able to properly regulate that cortisone to cortisol conversion. And now it's no different than being in a state of heightened stress because chemically you've got a higher cortisol burden. And that then causes your body to preferentially divert fuel towards visceral fat and away from skeletal muscle. So you're completely right. The whole detox thing and the fuel metabolism, it's, it's, all, it's all tied together. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really hard. I mean, I, I've been fighting this for years on the podcast and all the stuff that we've been doing is everyone is out there saying, okay, what's the answer? Oh, 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 it, it was, you know, it was toxicity. Oh, it was, you know, GMOs. And, and, and it's just, everyone wants to reduce and simplify. And what if the answer was all of it, right? And you right. just need to look at things and be, be a little more clear. So what does this mean for someone who has been, you know, very good at storing fuel, right? Like, and, and that, that's a common thing, right? Like most yeah. people in the modern world are carrying around more belly fat than they should, which is kind of an indicator that this, this equation isn't working right. Like, so what, what does one have to do to kind of back out of that mess? You know, and that's, that's the question is really like, what's the most effective way over the long term to spontaneously lower that fuel load? And I put a lot of thought in that. The basic idea is that you want to end up to where there's more more significant inches lost than weight loss. That's one helpful metric along the way. So the typical typical ratio is about an inch to four and a half pounds. So the more the more you're seeing, and, and I should be precise, inches around the belly button. So you wake mm. up in the morning, take a deep breath, you know, empty the bowels and bladder, uh, and relax your relax your abdomen and measure the circumference around the belly button. Now, the further you are away from that being half of your height, the better shape you're in. When that's above half of your height, that's one of the clearest dangers of all signs of chronic disease and brain aging imaginable. So yeah, the waist is what matters the most. And if you're dropping a bunch of pounds, but not many inches, you are not getting healthier. You know, you're mostly just losing muscle mass and you're losing glycogen. And what's going to happen is that you're going to rebound as predictably as you all, you'll take a deep breath after you hold your breath for a long time. Hmm. But if we can get it to where the inches lost become more substantial than an inch per four and a half pounds, then we know that what's happening is there's, there's a reduction in fat inside the liver. And at that point, the person's going to be at a point to where they will then stay at a good weight with, with you know, reasonable efforts. 
So to me, there's uh, an equation of fuel in and fuel out or burned fuel. So you're talking about quality of the carbs if you're taking resistant starches and things that have, uh, you know, kind of less less fuel to be stored. Uh, that helps, you know, the body, helps the microbiome, helps a lot of things, and also the quality of the fuel. Uh, but then the other side is, you know, expending it as well. So like, what does this look like for someone? It's like, okay, eat less, eat better quality, start doing more stuff. I mean, I'm... I'm, I'm Again, so as, as, little, as I'm trying to simplify it. So a little counterintuitive, but what, I, what I've argued is that, and what we've seen from a clinical trial that we've done recently is that uh, we, we actually discourage exercise during the 28-day reset process. So there's a 28-day there's a process, and the idea is to lower the fuel burden, but also lower the fuel requirements and supply your liver with cofactors it needs to properly tap into the trapped fuel stores. And then also to provide adequate protein to where there's no compromise of muscle mass, and there's adequate amino acids for the liver to really bind up and conjugate those fats and get them out. Those are some of the main ideas is, yeah, low, low fuel, adequate protein, and then good amounts of cofactors, and then very minimal exercise. The first week, I encourage nothing beyond a few, like five to 7,000 steps max of walking per day. The remaining portion, I, I built in some micro workouts. So it's two to five minutes, and they're different per day. And they're enough to keep the muscles engaged, but not enough to really create a heightened demand on fuel metabolism. That's interesting. So, so you got to clean up the economy before you start spending again. That's an awesome way of putting it. I'm going to steal that, but I will attribute that to you. That that's a really good way of putting it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah, you don't even need to attribute it. I, I just spew. <laughs> spew, spew. Um, <laughs> so, okay, so you clean it up. It takes 28 days to really kind of set the tone and and really uh, adjust the liver to understand like how it's going to burn, and then yeah. you start ramping up again with weight bearing exercise with cardio. Exactly. Like, what, what do you start doing? Yeah, after that, actually, that's that's the the best body of data we have. Is that exercise is not a game changer for healthy, rapid weight loss to be effective, but it's the game changer for maintaining that shift. So for sure, we encourage good amounts of activity, good varieties of activity, ideally a nice mix of strength, um, <clears throat> excuse me, cardio, but also like agility and balance activities are phenomenal. So yeah, it's super important afterwards. Got it, but not during because you know everyone goes to boot camp and then you know fails, right? Yeah, the beginning of the year, which is which is well, they're bigger challenges. you know they're they've got the the books aren't balanced and they're spending faster than ever is what's going on to use that mm-hmm. analogy. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's interesting. So what is it? So let's look at what. It, does it entail to balance the books, right? So the liver needs to understand energy in, energy out. Um, its requirements for the energy out go down. But I mean, my, my instinct would be then you need to put less fuel in because the yeah. liver's job is to store it as it comes in, right? So are mm-hmm. we restricting calories? Well, with the, the overall caloric load ends up being lower, but the, the protein still present. So the trick is, yeah, lowering the fuel side of the calories. So carbs, carbs and fats lower. And then also <clears throat> there are a few pitfalls that are inherent to rapid fat loss when it's occurring even in a healthy fashion. Uh, one of those can be the risk of gallstones forming or gout forming. So we work hard to make sure that with adequate protein, we're maintaining a good pH balance. We're doing more alkaline vegetable-based proteins. And that's just a good offset for some of those negative pH effects that can occur from from rapid mobilization of stored mm-hmm. fat. Mm-hmm. And during this process, does the liver start working harder to conjugate out some of the stored toxins? Like, is that is that part of this gestalt? It is. And that's also one of the important parts about high quality protein, because, yeah, most conjugation is really binding with essential amino acids. So that that's mm-hmm. the pitfall. You know, fasting is an awesome practice spiritually, psychologically. But there's many people to where it's not an effective thing for detox or waste loss because, you know, there's so much stuff that's hitting the liver, but now the liver is just like out of building blocks and out of tools to work with. So it's a hard time mm. for it. Mm. You, you need the trucks to haul the crap out of there. Exactly. Um, all right. So we're talking about essential amino acids. And then are we talking about kind of like methylation help? Like, so, so there's some supplemental support in this to help the liver along. You know, I did it really based upon foods, a lot of, a lot of food categories. Um, a big star are the APACA vegetables, you know, quite a bit of data about their role with some of the phase two ratios and phase two subtypes. These are things that 
not talked about quite as much, but uh, carrots, parsnips, parsley. Yeah, a lot of APACA compounds that are liver specific. So we choose a lot of food categories and they're all sequential for the four. There's like four stages we go through in the four week process and the foods are all sequential to the stage. Got it. How, how long have you been at this? How big is this clinical, clinical trial? I mean, and this is to a lot of people listening right now that this is new. Um, so, and it's novel in, in a lot of ways. So I just want to kind of back up and see how many people you've been doing this with and what results you've seen. Well, I think we're about boy, a little over 20,000 so far. And this is our fourth iteration that we've done a clinical trial on. The, the first version of it was I saw some data showing that for the first time, you, they could actually reverse diabetes. Like on CT scan, you could take someone who's type 2 diabetic and six weeks later rescan, and now their pancreas has regrown the insulin containing vesicles. And it was really exciting stuff. And that study was, it was like horrible quality food. It was like the corn syrup and corn oil, but it was, and, and their whole goal was just low calorie. It was like just 600 calories. And I saw that, and you know, with our background in natural medicine and foods and whatnot, I thought, I bet that would work better if we actually used food and, and did it mm. in a more reasonable fashion. So that was kind of the impetus. And in our work with reversing diabetes, I saw just how common this whole fatty liver thing was and how pervasive that was. And then I saw more data linking the more common metabolic stressors to this liver issue. You know, diabetes itself, metabolic syndrome, the emerging concept is leaky liver. Uh, what happened? What happened a few years ago we can now differentiate your blood sugar, whether it came from your meal or from your liver. And people that have early diabetes, metabolic syndrome, the old mindset was that, you know, their, their postprandial, their after meal high blood sugar was a consequence of a quickly absorbed carbohydrate based meal. And it spiked their blood sugar was what people would say that. Well, now that we can actually track that, we're seeing that's not the case that 80 to 90% of blood sugar elevations after a meal in someone who's metabolically compromised, it's what they made. It has no bearing upon their food. It's what their body's releasing. And even we even so, define, go ahead. So I just, just walk through the chain of custody there. Food drops yeah. in the gut, um, the body grabs it, uh, absorbs it in through the gut lining. Now mm -hmm. this form of fuel is on its way to the liver. Let's just, just, just walk through this because most people don't understand the, the, the pathway here. Yeah. So most, what we used to think was that pretty much as you were describing, you absorb the food, it comes into your bloodstream and you've got all this sugar you ate. I've seen people make inflammatory posts about like oatmeal. You eat oatmeal and it spikes your sugar and bad things happen. Well, what we're seeing now is that when we can really track it, your blood sugar spikes long before that food gets in your bloodstream and the food coming in your bloodstream is a pretty minor part of it. So your blood sugar spiking is because your liver's leaking. It's so full that any signal saying there's more stuff coming on board, it's just like dropping ballast. It's just like oh, pouring crap. fuel out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so a healthy liver, when it has a signal saying there's more fuel, so ooh, great, let's take this, let's process it, let's pack it up and send it to where it needs to go. Yeah. It's like, hey, I've got room for glycogen. Let's put some in the muscles too. And let's load this up and get ready for a good, good, some good physical activity in the coming days. That's interesting. So it's like the dock and then they see a new ship coming in and they're just like just throwing things overboard exactly. because they don't have room to take it. Well, and here's such an obvious example of that. You know, diabetes, we define that in one way by fasting glucose levels above 127. Fasting glucose, you wake up and your blood sugar's high. That's not your meal. That's, that's all from your liver. So that's that's a liver that's literally leaking in, leaking sugar into the bloodstream. The new, the new concept of diabetes is that it's a disease of the liver more than a disease of the pancreas. And then they're calling leaky liver the main cause behind that. Amazing. Amazing. Okay. So backing out of this and getting a liver to stop leaking is first of all, not stuffing it uh, so that it's overflowing, but then retraining it to understand what to do with fuel and how to reallocate it. Like I'm trying to understand how to balance these books. You know, it's honestly just getting rid of the over overcrowded triglycerides and getting glycogen built up again. That's what it comes down to. So the liver, you know, think about like, like guys, the, the math is closer for guys. You know, we're, we're reasonably healthy at 15% body fat. We're lean at 10%, you know, take all those numbers and have to like divide them by four for your liver. So your liver above 5% fat is pathological. You know, it gets sick with that. And there's this whole thing to where this fatty liver syndrome exists on a big, big continuum. A lot of folks have that at early stages. And what's gone on is that you've, you've crowded out the glycogen. You've got no more kindling left to burn the logs. And there's all these logs coming on board. 
So when, mm. when your body gets new fuel, you're dumping out what's there. You've got no use for it. And you might even build even more triglyceride stores because you've got no choice. You're sitting, you're sitting on a, a pile of logs and you're still cold because you can't start a fire. That's spot on. Yeah. That's amazing. That's a great analogy what, too. Okay. So people out there who've got blood work that, you know, their doctor's kind of thrown at them. What would you see in your blood work um, that could possibly be pointing to what we're talking about here? So the funny thing about fatty liver, um, I'm looking out my my deck. You got to come see the new place. You haven't been here yet, but looking out the deck and, you know, we get rattlesnakes sometimes. We're in the Sonoran Desert, but I don't see any right now. But it wouldn't be logical for me to say there's no rattlesnakes because I don't see them, right? So mm -hmm. if you saw them, you could know that they're there. But if you don't see them, you don't know that they're not there. And a lot of medical conditions, medical conditions are like that. There's some obvious rule ins, but there's no obvious rule outs. So fatty liver, the only rule out is biopsy. And the only circumstance I'm aware of in which healthy people ever have liver biopsies is when they're planning to donate liver tissue to a loved one. You know, they've got to do, make sure they're not diabetic, check a lot of blood tests, do an ultrasound. And if everything looks clear, the last step is a biopsy. And in situations just like that, 40.2% of healthy adults who are, who are possible liver donors cannot donate liver tissue because they've got advanced fatty liver disease. It's that prevalent. So 40.2% and then who yeah, jumped yeah, through all yeah. the hoops. And, and so when you look at them, is their BMI uh, normal or is it also like, the, would, would it correlate with BMI? Would it correlate with some of the other things that we would uh, it, you know, flag? It does correlate, uh, but these are people that have already ruled that out as well. So the, the stronger, as far as an easy metric, the stronger one is that height to waist ratio. So your height to waist. So if your if your belt, you know, if your belt around your belly button is more than half of your height, that's a big sign towards that. You mentioned blood work. So this is a rule. This is a this is a red flag, but not a rule out. There's liver enzymes on blood work. A lot of folks have them elevated, not explained, but way inside normal. If you're a woman and your ALT, your alanine aminotransferase, is above 19. That's a red flag for liver function being abnormal. And this is something that's just universally regarded amongst liver specialists. There's no debate about this one. And normal ranges may be as high as 45 or 63 based upon your regional lab. Uh, guys, we got leeway up to 30, but that can be well within normal, but at a range saying there's something wrong with your liver. And there's other things that can cause that for sure, like medication reactions or undiagnosed hepatitis. But barring anything else left more exotic, we assume fatty liver until proven otherwise. So does this work the other way too? Because I mean, part of it is, you know, all this talk we have around, you know, kind of all these circles about how the world is toxic and, you know, the, the smokestacks are choking us and our bodies can't handle it. Um, and so in that direction, it's like, okay, it doesn't help to be huffing paint um, and having the liver have to do all this. But what about the other way around? If your liver is having so much trouble storing energy and dealing with all of this kind of fuel uh, mis mismanagement, uh, would it make it harder for you to process toxic? toxins be more susceptible to issues with toxins because it's just too busy on the other side of the fence? It certainly would. It works both ways. So the effects yeah. of toxins, the effects upon regulating your hormones, the effects upon regulating your brain chemistry. These are all things that get compromised when there's fuel overload. Yeah, it, make, it makes perfect sense. Um, and so, wow. So in 28 days, you've run uh, enough people through this to make it really interesting to me. Um, what do people start seeing? Like, what is the process? Is like, you know, for after, you know, are, are they just kind of tired and lethargic in the first week? Like, how does it go? And what does it take to rebalance these books? You know, of course, there's a continuum and there's, of course, distinct reactions, but there's really strong themes. And some things, some things we see, there's some things we see really consistent that we expect and some that we've come to expect that we didn't so much going into it. So some of the things that are exciting, exciting signs are when the inches are way ahead of what we expect for the pounds. I mean, that's like a huge sign of a big success. We, we've, we've done this in a way to where there's a, a seven day challenge we offer. Someone can try it out for a week and see if they're making some headway on their health. And if so, then yeah, they can do the rest of the 28. And so we've got feedback from the seven days and from the 28 days and also from longer term follow-up. But the seven days, we'll commonly see two, three inches lost just then. And maybe wow. maybe only maybe only four to six pounds, but but two three inches, and that's a really big sign that there's the right kind of stuff is going off quickly. So that's that's one. Other things we really expect are blood sugar to normalize. Um, clinically, 
we've gotten very confident taking someone who's you know on di on medication for type two diabetes and stopping medicine on day one and starting the program. And day twenty eight, rechecking them now off medication and seeing them non diabetic. So there's a few people who've been diabetic for more than twenty years are quite brittle, but they're exceptional. So that's predictable. Um, triglycerides, glucose, cholesterol, blood pressure, pretty predictable things to improve. What's really lit me up lately, there's the science about this com these compounds called adipokines. And they're like inflammatory chemicals like cytokines, but the worst ones imaginable. And adipo, they're from fat cells. So it turns out that all the, all the inflammatory things, the autoimmune, the arthritis, the inflammatory bowel disease, even neurologic things like IBS, that one of the biggest drivers of them are the presence of these adipokines. So we have people all the time saying that their autoimmunity has made a, has, has reversed, their chronic Epstein-Barr has gotten better. Their, we used to think that arthritis was better from weight loss because there was just less stuff you were carrying on your knees. You, know, you had less weight in the backpack, so to speak. But the new model is that, no, it wasn't that. It's that there's less inflammation. There's less systemic inflammation. So that little change is huge in every way for the body. That's fascinating because I, I know one of the more exciting things happening on, on the other side of the fence for the cytokines is the, you know, NF kappa B and the ability to mm -hmm. kind of modulate um, the expression of, of, of these inflammatory markers in the body. But you're saying that the fat cells are setting, sending off their own chemical messengers mm -hmm. and telling the body to get inflamed in They're places that we don't want. They are bigger drivers of the inflammatory process than anything else we could think of. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Uh, man, I'm in. I, I, want, I want to do this. Um, you tell me when I could start my 28 days, I'll do it. I'll report back to my audience. But um, this, this makes perfect sense to me. And um, I think that it's something that my audience should... Uh, I'm going to start a new gong right now anyways. So my audience should just do with me. Look, 28 days from now, you're going to be 28 days older and chances are, if you haven't done anything different, uh, nothing's going to change. So, you know, it's, it's not that long, uh, as a trial. So I want to do it. Tell people how to find, uh, your new work and how to get involved in all this. Yeah, for sure. You know, we'll be at metabolismresetdiet.com and I'll get you all connected and linked in and it'll be a cool thing. I'll be doing it as well. And, and th the thing is, is that, as central, and, and you know, with oriental medicine, we've talked forever about how important the liver is to all this kind of stuff. But as, as central as it is, the exciting side is that it's also so, you know, resilient and so mm. able to rejuvenate. So it's, it's phenomenal to see how much the body can change so quickly when it gets the right opportunity. That's it. That's it. Um, I've seen it. I've seen it so many times in my career and my clinical practice. It's just, you know, as soon as someone starts getting healthy, everything else gets better. <laughs> uh, and it doesn't take that long. It's like, you know, within a, within a month or two, people are like, what the, what the hell happened to you? Right. Like you're a new person. <laughs> right. And a, and a new person. I mean, talk about a new liver. How long does it take for liver cells to, you know, how long, how long before you have a brand new liver? It's one of the fastest replicating organs, isn't it? That can happen in about six weeks and you can be 95% there in about 28 days. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, you know, so many people are stuck in their ways for decades, right? And, you know, in one month, you have a brand new liver, which runs the show of the entire economy <laughs> of your body. And it seems to me to be a highly, highly leveraged place to start. Yeah. So I'm in. Awesome, man. It's so good to hear your voice. I'm so glad you're still, you know, doing what you do. Uh, one of my favorite stories of uh, Dr. Christensen is um, there's all these guys like huffing and puffing on their mountain bikes in the Sonoran <laughs> Desert, like 100, 100 degree weather, they're, like trying to, you know, be all macho and going up these hills. And here comes Alan Christensen on a unicycle, passing them up while they're panting on the side of the trail, waving at them like, how do you, how do we doodly neighbor? Right? It's just like this sweetheart of a guy just blowing by all these meat heads. And he's just super, he's like, he's, he's one of the most fit people I've ever met. It's embarrassing to go rock climbing with him. So, you know, he's doing something right. So the, the fun comment is, oh, look, you guys got training wheels on that thing. <laughs> the ultimate shit talker by not even doing it, right? <laughs> so good. So good. Well, listen, I love you, man. I can't wait to do this. I'll film my pro progress on this. Um, you know, look, I, it's you know, the holidays ended. I got, I, I definitely got an inch or two that I'd love to see go away. And so let's spend 28 days doing it together. Um, and and uh, I'll report back to the audience and any of you listening, uh, do it with me. Let's, let's, let's do this. Let's test it. You know, worst case scenario, you're a little healthier and a little thinner. I can't, I can't think of a downside. <laughs> 
Awesome. All right, Doc, always a pleasure. Uh, keep up the good work and um, I'll figure out the details of when I'm going to start and I'll share it with my audience and um, let's have some fun. Sounds awesome. Let's do it, dude. Thank All you. Right. Take care, man.